So today, um, what I'm going to talk about is quality, food quality, what that means, um, and different issues with respect to valuation of food quality and, and consumers' perception of food quality. So I'm going to say today that demand for food quality is a really complex issue, and understanding demand. So I just want to emphasize that demand is not attitudes. Demand is actually the value that people place on it. So I'm an economist, I have to make that point, right? We look at demand and supply, um, and demand is about a mixture of price and quantity and the price people are willing to pay for things. Um, I'm going to say that consumers' um, perceptions of quality are really heterogeneous. So if I were to do a survey of all of you guys in this room and ask you to write a sentence explaining what food quality means to you, I would get you know, as many different answers as there are people in this room, and some of them I might be able to segment you into different groups of people. So that's what I mean by heterogeneous, that people differ in terms of what they perceive quality to mean or how they determine quality. I'm also going to say that consumers make trade-offs among different quality attributes. For example, sometimes price, um, particularly in wine, um, when people are unknowledgeable or unsure about products, they use price sometimes to signal quality. So how we determine quality as food consumers really depends upon a lot to do with our background, um, our values, our perceptions, our experiences. Um, and that we make trade-offs all the time. So I might really want to buy a certain product, for example, that's animal welfare friendly um, or free range, but if it's too expensive, I can't afford to buy it. So I make trade-offs. That's what I mean by that point. Um, and finally, the point I want everybody to walk away with is that consumers' intentions don't equal demand. So all those surveys that are done all the time about attitudes, yeah, so attitudes give you insight on how preferences might be changing and how demand might be shifting. But over time, we've got to remember that price, particularly when it comes to um, food, does play a role. So, and I'll talk about what I mean by that a little bit more. So just in the last few weeks, um, what we mean by quality or what we think about for quality in this country has changed. So what's quality from an economist standpoint when we look at this when we're doing consumer research? So we would put quality, quality cues, cues people use when they're buying food, and this is research across the globe, kind of put this researchers working on consumer behavior and around um, food quality. We put these in three different categories. The first one, search attributes, okay? And search attributes really have something to do with when I pick up a package at the store, things I can look at the package and search for and see, okay? It might be price, it might be country of origin, it might be nutrition, um, it might be a grade or a standard like meat if the MSA logo's on there, um, it might be the APL logo in pork. Experience attributes are more the technical quality attributes, okay? Those might be things about how does it feel in my mouth, how does it taste, is it sweet, um, is it spicy, um, is it chewy, is it tough when it comes to meat, all those things, they're experience. Now, I might buy a brand and I find that that brand is really um, low, low has, has poor taste, poor experience quality, and so I associate then quality with the brand based on my experience. So then finally, the third one, and this is one that's really growing in terms of, of an attribute or a cue that consumers use to determine quality, and these are credence attributes. These are things like organic, um, free range, um, fair trade. They're attributes that may or may not um, signal traditional quality or technical quality, but they're things consumers associate with quality. And they require some sort of system to verify, otherwise they're just a marketing claim. So they are related to the process of the food product or how it's grown, process or production attributes. So when we try to estimate demand for quality, again, like I said, it's much more than just doing an attitudinal survey because we have to think about this. So research would show that consumers, when they're determining their willingness to pay for something or the value they'll place, whether or not they're going to ultimately buy it versus say they'll buy it or say they're interested, it's these things on the right, so their values, their knowledge, pr things we call priors, attitudes, trust in certain companies, and even things like socio-demographics. It might have to do with I'm originally American, so I might value American more than, say, Chinese and be okay with the product that's from the United States. Um, it might have to do with income. It might have to do with age. So all those things influence demand. Study shows it time and time again. It might have to do, on the left-hand side, with 
things like the perceived value for money, the eating enjoyment, the nutrition, the satiation that we're going to get out of it. So when we look at food quality cues, there's really now this myriad of things, this many things from traditional to environmental, ethical, production processes, health, nutritional, geographical, and then where does food safety fit in there? Because embedded in many of these things is perceptions about food safety. When we do research with consumers and ask them why they buy free range, you'll hear a certain section of our segment of consumers say because they think it's healthier or safer. And I'll show you some research on that. So this is just some examples of the different quality cues that are on products of food. So this is an actual product I've covered, or Nairis um, covered up the brand there, but you can guess what brand it is. But just to show you, this is a package that I actually bought, of chicken that we actually bought for our household, and the different information. You have a brand, a certification that has some underpinning system underneath of it, a production claim free from added hormones and growth promotants, and then um, other types of production claims. So RSPCA certified. This is even, now we're seeing more and more back of package information. This is from a package of beef where it's talking about certified pasture fed, meat standards Australia, livestock, welfare certified. So that's all the information. So it's not surprising that in our research in Australia we're seeing in the, in the um, eight or so years I've been doing research here, we're hearing more and more consumers say that they're really confused. Um, and they're getting more cynical. Um, there's a lack of understanding about what things they're actually signal quality, what signals safety. Um, they perceive, for example, claims like organic to mean safer, healthier, better for the environment, guaranteed improved welfare. Now, none of those necessarily fit under organic. This is a study we've done this year, just an online study. It's not published yet, so I should say that it hasn't been under peer review. But this is just actually showing you we we presented these different labels to consumers, a large sample of consumers. And just to show you, these are percentage of people that say, for example, that the different certifications signal safer. And these are where I get concerned when I'm looking at this from a policy standpoint. So 20% um, perceive RSPCA approved farming to mean that it's safer or healthier. Or the Australian certified organic to 26% perceive it to be safer. 37% perceive it to be healthier. That label actually has nothing to do necessarily with healthier. Um, okay, so consumers are increasingly conflicted about what quality means. And if we're looking at valuing it, so consumers' value of quality, we, we value public things. So we place a value on public attributes or altruistic attributes, social values. So things around the environment, um, local, whether or not it was grown locally, workers, society, animal welfare. We value all those public attributes as well as private values. So ultimately, what determines my willingness to pay for quality, it's a mix of these things, and it probably has to do with my purchasing scenario too. If I'm at the store with a three-year-old chucking a temper tantrum at six o'clock at night, I just want to get out of the store and make sure that the product's safe. Um, so I just want to show you a quick example of a beef study that we did to kind of support what I'm saying here. This was done in 2010, so take that into account. These results would probably be different, undoubtedly, if I did it today. What we did is we actually did an online study, and in this study we asked consumers a whole bunch of attitudinal questions. But before about um, if they'd buy products with different certifications, what they perceived those certifications to mean, and this was around meat. And if they thought about what country of origin it was from, um, if they wanted additional safety certifications, and I'm only going to show you a small amount. But before we asked them about attitudes, we actually had them participate in a simulated shopping um, experiment. These are called choice experiments. They're used a lot by the private sector to predict demand for products, everything from your phones to um, your clothes to food products. And so they get screenshots like this and they're asked to choose which product you'd want. Price is varying, different attributes are varying, and you can see even fat contents varying in these. So just to give you an idea, these are the different attributes. So we looked at everything from grain and grass fed, different local brands, um, heart, the heart tick, um, Australian beef, and these are some, some South Australian brands as well as King Island beef, so a, a variety of brands, and then different claims like hormone-free, antibiotic-free. 
And when we asked him, I just want to show you what I mean that um, what people say doesn't actually, what people say is important to him doesn't actually translate into buying behavior. So out of our consumers, 30% said that they were very concerned about hormones and antibiotics. Okay, so just take that into account. 38% said they believe it's really important to purchase local. Okay, I want to, this is to show you just misperceptions. So I don't want to pick on any label or certification. Let's pick the National Heart Foundation just to show you in 2010 misperceptions among a representative sample of beef consumers. Roughly 40% of the consumers in the study ticked that they thought National Heart Foundation, a product with National Heart Foundation on it, to be a safer choice. Now that claim has nothing to do with safety. So rightly or wrongly, it's misleading consumers. Okay? Perceptions of production claims, grain-fed beef, better quality tender, that's the kind of things that we want it to be signaling, um, hormone and antibiotic free, to have less food safety risks, that's not necessarily the case. Um, hormone and antibiotic free, to be better for my health, again, not necessarily the case, but yet um, over 25% of consumers perceived it to mean that. So this is just giving you an idea. It's not that people are trying to get consumers to believe this, but it's showing you that this is signaling potentially improper or misleading information to consumers. Okay, so in this study, 30% of consumers said that it's extremely important to them whether, whether or not the animals have um, had hormones or antibiotics used in the production practice. And, you know, 38%, I think, said local is really important. Now, when it comes down to that choice experiment and what was actually impacting or influencing their buying behavior, that's what this is showing. So 35% of the buying decision, and this is the aggregate, this is on average for the sample of consumers we use, the 1,100 and some consumers, 35% of that is influenced by price. Obviously, higher price makes them less likely to buy the product. 46% of the buying behavior is influenced by the internal fat so marbling in the steak, and then external fat, 11%. When it comes down to the impact of these credence cues, so whether it's health or forage claims or production, whichever ones I showed you, they're less than 5%. They influence less than, they play a very small role, even though consumers said it was important to them. And this is simulated. So if you get in an actual setting where people are putting their money where their mouth is, essentially, it would probably be even less, okay? That's the aggregate. So we have done segmentation, and we do show there's segments that value these and are more likely to actually have them influence their buying de decision, but that's at the aggregate. So I think I'll skip this one. It's basically just showing that even though marbling, higher marble from a quality standpoint is higher quality, consumers actually place a lower value on higher marbled. So a technical quality attribute such as marbling Higher marbled, producers get paid more for higher marbled beef, right? So higher marbled is higher valued from the production side of things. Consumers in this study actually discounted it because they see it as fat. Ooh, fat, fat, okay? So also, if we look at the health claim, the only one that was really had kind of a high average value was the heart tick. If we look in MSA, but it's still only 17 cents, very small, that's, that's in terms of a premium, less than 1% premium. If we look at production certifications, environmentally sustainable was the highest valued one, but the hormone and antibiotic free that had the highest share of people saying that it was important, it wasn't even significant when it came out to looking at the willingness to pay values. Certified humane was actually discounted in this study. Okay, now there's lots of caveats. So my final slide here, some key messages. Attitudes do not equal demand, okay? Attitudes don't equal demand. So just because, for example, let's talk about country of origin. People say country of origin is very important to them, right? They use it to help signal quality. That doesn't mean that they're going to pay more for, for product that has that information on it. That doesn't mean they're going to pay more for Australian product, okay? Um, a complex set of factors help determine consumer demand. So demand is more about more than just attitudes. It comes down to this huge set of things that determine our purchasing behavior. And what an average consumer buys on a normal shopping experience on a Saturday or Sunday for food differs when they're buying it for a special occasion.
Um, quality, there's technical quality attributes, and as we showed with marbling, technical quality is not always in line with what consumers place a value on. So the example of higher marbled being higher valued to the industry, yet consumers discount it in the supermarket. Um, Consumers' perceptions of quality are really heterogeneous, really varied. Everybody in here has different perceptions of quality, and they're really dynamic. Issues like the berry scare changes probably the importance, and, and oftentimes just for a short amount of time, places the importance we place on things like country of origin or, or certain, you know, when the big um, animal welfare issue broke out related to live export. For a while, probably people placed a higher value on and certified humane type of products. Um, it's a treadmill. So we were doing some work last week with the, the meat industry. And as one um, South Australian um, meat retailer said, it's just really frustrating that they, she feels like she's constantly on this treadmill of trying to figure out what consumers want. It's exhausting, was her quote. Um, and strategy is really essential for signaling quality. So we need to think about do we want brands or labels? Do we want certifications that anybody can adopt? Or is it more important to build brand, our brand strategy or what our brand means? And the very last point is really credibility is crucial. And this is where I argue a lot that when it comes to food labeling and things around these credence attributes that Australia really needs to look at having some standards so that organic means the same thing. Um, or free range means the same thing, so that we start having a national standard for what that means. Um, and that's probably after doing a lot of work on that when I was living in the United States and, and understanding what Europe does around those standards too. So I just think that, that there's um, potentially an opportunity to gain more value for the people who are interested in, in producing products with those unique credence attributes for us to have a standard in this country like they do in other countries where those are really valued. So that's it.